always forget to unmute myself. I do it every time. One of these days, I'm going to remember it before I walk up here. Anyways, good morning, everybody. I am so excited that you guys are here in the house this morning together. Um, I am our kids director, so normally I'm not in service to be able to watch the five-minute video. And this morning I was watching it, and I just... I love seeing just how much God has moved over the past almost eight years at New Life and just being able to see um, the church, the people in this church, all of you guys making a difference in our community. And so it's just, it's really cool. It was very special to me. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, As I said, I'm our kids director. My name is Aaliyah Rowland. Um, I absolutely love being the kids director here at New Life Church. I often will say, and I truly believe this, that it is an absolute honor and a privilege. Um, I feel like teaching kids about Jesus is probably one of the best jobs in the entire world. And to be able to see kids learn about Jesus for the first time and get that foundation is just so fun to watch. Um, And it challenges me to grow in my faith even more because they're growing so much. Um, As I was preparing for today, I was like, I want to give you guys just a little cool story about our kids' ministry Um, that I experienced last week. So in our kids' ministry, we've been averaging probably, I would say like four to five new kids a week, which is good. Um, But last week, we had a new family who was new the week before. They came back, and their kids had invited all of their friends. So we had 12 new kids in the first service alone. Yeah. Yep. And then we had five the following service. So we had 17 new kids in total. And what I thought is, I was so, I, my entire team, if my, some of my kids' team members are in service today, and we were so fired up because we we're like, wow, there's so many new kids. But what's so cool to me is that sometimes kids are better at inviting people to church than we are as adults. And so I thought to myself, man, when was the last time I invited 12 of my friends? So it was a good challenge for me and hopefully for you guys as well. Um, I just wanted to say quick welcome to anyone who's watching online. Hello, whatever camera is on my face. Hello. (laughs) We're happy you're here too. Um, Before I get into this message, um, I and our church are really big on honoring people. Um, I love how the Life Church in Memphis, which is where we take our students for the Access Conference, how they talk about honor and they talk about honoring up, honoring down and honoring all around. And so I wanted to take a moment just to honor our pastors, Dan and Kelsey Smith. Um, I know a lot of times people will come up here and say like, they're just so nice, they're great people, and they are, (laughs) they are, don't get me wrong. (laughs) But I think when I was thinking, you know, of a way that we can honor them, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the things that you guys love here at New Life Church Um, our dream team, being able to serve on Sundays, being able to have an impact yourselves, not just the staff having an impact, Um, life groups, the merch wall that's out there, the design of a lot of things, a lot of that comes from Pastor Dan and Kelsey's vision. And so I am so thankful today, and I know that so many of you are thankful for their vision and their obedience to carry out what God has given them, because sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes it costs a lot. But I'm so thankful that we follow um, a pastor who is following God. So can we go ahead and give them honor this morning? So this morning, if you're taking notes, which we say note takers are world changers. Yep. If you're taking notes, I'll give you the title of it because I know some people really like that. If my friend Jillian's in here, she likes that. So it's for you, Jillian. Um, It's called The Crucified Life. How many of you guys were here uh, when we did the study on Ephesians? Anyone? Yeah. I loved that series. Did y'all like it too? Yeah, Yeah, I loved it because I love being able to sometimes really dive into a book of the Bible and kind of go scripture by scripture. And I love that we're doing that now with the book of Galatians. Um, So last week, Pastor Dan opened up the sermon series on the book of Galatians, and he talked about Galatians 1, 6, and 7, and the one true gospel. And he asked us a couple different questions, but one that stood out to me was he asked us, if we thought we can earn our salvation, which, spoiler alert, we can't. (laughs) Um, And he gave us three different ways to live a life following the one true gospel. I highly recommend, if you missed it last week, go into that app that we talked about and go ahead and watch it on there. It's awesome. So he also really did a good job of teeing up my message because a lot of Galatians is about 
the same sort of thing. So you might hear some things today that you heard last week, but it's a good continuation of what we learned last week. So if you have your Bible here today, go ahead and grab it out. I brought my own Bible today. This one's new. It's a little bit heavy. I was like, wow. I was like passing it to the kids' team, and I was like, you can get an arm workout with this thing. But my other one's covered in coffee stains, so I figured this one was better. Um, Yeah. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Galatians 2, 11 through 21. Um, While you're getting there, I always like to say, sometimes you might read the Bible, and you might read it, and it might totally just go right over your head. Anybody ever have that happen before? Yeah. And so my husband and I really are big into trying it and reading something in a different translation. So maybe today, hopefully today I do a good job explaining it. But if you're finding in your Bible, I don't really get this. Try something new. Is everybody there? Yep. Cool. All right, let's get started. All right. Here we go. But when Cephas, hold up, some of you guys in your Bible, you might have the headings, and it says that Paul opposes Peter. So you might be thinking, who is Cephas? Like, who is this guy? That's another name for Peter in Aramaic, which is a language that Jesus and a lot of the people during this time period spoke. So it's Peter. (laughs) Don't worry. So when Cephas came to Antioch, I, this is Paul speaking, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the gospel of truth, I said to Cephas before all of them, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, How can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? I'm going to be really honest with you guys. Um, I probably have read the book of Galatians probably 10 times in my entire lifetime. I don't think I've ever actually read that part. I think I've always glossed over it because I read it and I was like, huh, okay, this is cool. But even as I read it, the first time I read it, I was like, "What what is this trying to tell me? And then I read it again, still thought the same thing. So I had to take my own advice and look it up in a different translation. I like the Amplified version because it has a little bit more fluff to it, and I like that. (laughs) And I had to read it. So let me go ahead and explain it for you guys too. So before I do that, I want to set the scene. So in this, um, Paul, Barnabas, and Peter are all in Antioch, which Antioch is a city that uh, in modern day is on the like border of Syria and Turkey. And they are there um, as Jews, and they are amongst Gentiles. So they're eating with them, you know, they're hanging out with them, they're teaching them about the good news. So um, they're having a good time. Well, back in Acts chapter 10, which if you've never read Acts chapter 10, please go read it. It's probably one of the coolest chapters in the Bible. I really like it. But in Acts chapter 10, God gave Peter a vision. And what this vision was is that God shows Peter that his goodness and his salvation isn't just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. Now, at the time, the Gentiles were considered unclean. They weren't allowed in synagogues. They weren't weren't associated with a lot of the Bible. They were kind of seen as, like, outside of it. So this, when God showed him this vision, that meant that they were supposed to be one and they were united in their faith. So we know that as this continues, we see that Peter is kind of taking a step back when other Jewish people come that are maybe more focused on the law. It says in here, um, it calls them the circumcision party, which as Pastor Dan talked about last week, they were more focused on the ceremonial law, the different um, sacrificial practices that you did to remove your sin, as opposed to the relationship And we know that ceremonial law was abolished when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So Peter is bending to fit in with the other Jews, maybe because he's a little bit nervous, maybe because he thinks that they're going to think less of him. But in the Amplified Version, it says that this act of removing himself and the other Jews um, going along with Peter 
it ignores their knowledge that Jewish and Gentile Christians are united under the new covenant and one faith. And Paul calls them out for it because he knows that's not what this is all about. Let's go ahead and continue in 2, 15 through 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if our endeavor to be justified in Christ were, uh, we were too to be found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live, in, uh, I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I love that passage. It's so beautiful. I love that this is such a good picture of our Savior. I love that God doesn't require us to jump through different hoops in order to earn our salva- to order to earn salvation from him and his love. He freely gives it to us through his grace and his love for us. Pastor Dan talked about it last week, for our good deeds don't get us into heaven. The sacrifi- um, the ceremonial law that they're talking about this, it's ceremonial law. Just want to point out, please still follow like moral and civil law. You still still need to do that. Um, But the ceremonial law, we don't have to do that because that was what Jesus did. He was the final sacrifice. So our faith gets us into heaven. And when I was thinking of this and like, because sometimes we can sometimes think we have to do things in order to earn something. I'm a person that I'm like, I feel like I have to earn everything. But with God, we don't. We don't serve a transactional God. We serve a God who already paid the transaction fees for our salvation. I love in this scripture, and um, it, it talks about a certain word a couple times besides law. And if you're in the Bible recap, um, Tara Lee Cobble does a really good job of helping us look at scripture um, a little bit more closely. And in this passage, in this section, the word justification comes up a lot, or justified. And I had to like look up what justified means, because when I think of justified, my biggest like thought is how many of you guys have ever made like a purchase before? Maybe for your house, maybe if you're a girl or a guy, maybe a new shirt that was a little bit more expensive than you should have paid. And then you're like, okay, well, I made this much money working at work overtime. I did X, Y, Z. So that way, when, you know, for me, when my husband would come home, I would already have a bunch of good reasons of why I bought it. <laughs> And it would kind of soften the blow of like, yeah, I spent X, Y, Z on this, but you know what? I did this and this and this to make up for it. That's not necessarily what justified means in this. Um, So I looked it up, and uh, uh, Britannica says that in Christian theology, justification is the act by which God moves a willing person from a state of sin, unjustice, to a state of grace or righteousness, justice. And I love that. It's a willing person. You have to be willing for God to move you from your sin in order to have that grace. It's, it's, a, it's a both and. We weren't removed from our sinful state because of our deeds. It doesn't say in here, because you did X, Y, Z, you completed the checklist. It's because of the grace of God and his righteousness. So my sermon is about the crucified life. And if you're listening closely, or maybe... You know this because it's probably one of the most quotable verses in the Bible. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that. It's one of my favorite verses because it really helps us to be able to come down to the thought of like, what does it mean to be a Christian? When we become a Christian, we look different and we, our life has to look different because as Paul talks about in this verse, Christ lives in us as Christians. And we need to reflect that 
by not just living in our flesh, what our earthly wants and desires are, but by our faith, which is what God wants and what God desires. We have to live a life crucified with Christ, especially in the days that we're living now. It's crazy. Every day there's something new. And there are three different ways that you can do that, amongst other things. But today I'm going to give you three points. And, you know, maybe you're a person who loves to have a checklist and you just cross it off and you're like, okay, check, check, check. I'm good. Yay. I'm so sorry to tell you that's not what today's message is like. (laughs) Because this is something that you have to do daily. This is something that you can't just do one time and be done. It is daily. Sometimes it's every couple hours. You never know. So point number one, fall in love with Jesus. If you were here last week, you know this was Pastor Dan's first point. But truly, in order to live a crucified life with Christ, you have to know him and you have to love him. So I'm married. My husband and I have been married for three years and one week. Last, year, last week, we celebrated our three-year anniversary. Yeah, so exciting. <laughs> and, and when you go into marriage, you have to get to know that person pretty well before you marry them. You don't just enter in a lifelong commitment with somebody that you don't know. If you did that, come find me in the lobby. I'd love to hear your story. But you don't do that. You have to know them first. We aren't going to live a life crucified with Christ if we don't know him and know who he is first. We have to understand him and why living a life crucified with him is important. A lot of times people will also say that the people you're closest around, you start to sound like, look like, all of those things. And that's true also for spending time with God. When we spend more time around God, we become more like him, and we, be, we know the things that he desires and the things that he wants, so it helps us put away what our fleshly desires are. The more you come to church, read your Bible, pray, worship, you get to know God more, who in this passage sent his only son to die for you. A really great way to know God more and to be able to spend time with God more, come to 21 Days of Prayer. It, it has completely changed my life and my husband's life We um, had been coming to New Life for quite a long time, and we got on the dream team, and we were serving, and it was great. But when we fully committed into coming to 21 Days of Prayer every single day, you know, or at least every single time that we could, we had to make sacrifices. We eat dinner probably at 9 o'clock during 21 Days of Prayer. So, you know, sacrifices. But it's worth the sacrifice in order to know the Savior. So please come. It starts today. Tomorrow we meet for the first time, Monday through Friday, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and Saturdays, 10 to 11. I love what John 14, 15 says. And it says, if you love me, keep my commands. Or some translations say, obey my commands. And a lot of times people will hear that verse and they're like, ugh, really? I don't want to have to follow a lot of rules. This isn't fun. Being a Christian isn't fun because I don't get to do what I want but they're not living on the right side of that comma. See, if you notice, it says, if you love me first before it asks for obeying the commandments. And what I love about that is it shows us that we can't follow God's commands if we don't love him fully first. He calls us to live to a higher standard and to a life that looks different to what the world says is good. But That's the whole point of living a crucified life. Point number two, it says to die to yourself daily. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, uh, this is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. It's one of his letters. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and the spirit of God dwells in your midst? I love that. God, uh, when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and dwells in us, so each of us has a part of has, um, God's spirit in us. In order to live a life crucified with Christ, we have to remember that in our daily choices. We have, um, we have to think, is this choice of my flesh, or is it in my faith? And we have to decide if it's something that we have to die to ourselves on. And this means no longer saying yes to things that maybe make us feel good, but they're grieving the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God that is inside of us. 
So I actually had an example of this that happened a couple weeks ago. And uh, so a little bit more about me. I'm 27. I'm married. I don't have any kids yet. So my husband and I have this little thing called downtime. <laughs> and the parents in the room are like, what's that? <laughs> So in my downtime, I love watching a good movie or a TV show. Like, that is, like, my favorite. That's my favorite. That is what I do when I go home. It's awesome. I grew up in a house where we watch movies all the time. Um, in that house where I grew up, we would watch a lot of things, but my parents were very particular on what we were allowed to watch. Some would maybe say sheltered. I say smart, <laughs> but you can decide. Amen. Just saying. But... Um, because I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of things, when I left to go to college, I was like, free for all, I get to watch whatever I want. And I did. Mom, I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but because I was watching whatever I wanted to, I was grieving the Holy Spirit that was inside of me because I was watching things I should not have. So recently, I was watching a show that's very current on TV, and um, I started to feel a check in my spirit that maybe this isn't something that I should be watching. And I think my first sign should have been the commercial that had a lot of witchcraft in it um, that only played during the commercials of that show. Like, very strange. But God was definitely trying to talk to me. And then they had an episode on the show that was very inappropriate for a married woman to watch. And so I had to die to self myself because I love watching that show. I find it very entertaining, but I knew that it was grieving the Holy Spirit inside of me, and it wasn't worth continuing to watch. And I want you to know that, like, I'm not saying that you don't live a crucified life if you're watching things like that, because that's not my spiritual walk. That's yours. But what I can say is that if you feel like you have to do something in secret, or if you feel like uh, kind of yucky afterwards, it's probably grieving the Holy Spirit inside of you, and it is worth asking God to check your heart on because it's not worth grieving that Holy Spirit. If it is, if it is um, making you feel yucky, get rid of it. It's a hard choice, and you might have to make it every day, but I can tell you it is worth it. Point number three is don't bend. So if we go a little bit further back into our reading, in verses 11 through 14, Paul is calling out Peter for his conduct. And there was so much to learn from that of what, looking, what, a life looking, <laughs> what a life that is crucified with Christ looks like. So in this part, again, Peter's singing out with the Gentile Christians and everything's great until the people come who are more focused on the ceremonial law. And Peter changes who he is and what he looks like based on who he's around in this story. And Paul, as his friend and a fellow believer, calls him out on it. When I read this, I thought, how often do we as Christians change who we are to match who we're around? Peter knew. Guys, God gave Peter the vision that Jews and Gentiles were the same. Like, we're both welcomed into the family of Christ. So Peter knew that God said that to him. But still, Peter ignored it to match who he was around. Living a life crucified with Christ means that who we are in Christ doesn't change based on who we are around. We don't bend ourselves to fit into a mold that we think will get us more likes or more friends. And if we do, we're at risk of losing what God has for us. So I used to be a former teacher, and I love having a good prop. So this is my prop today. And if a spider crawls out of it, I'm, I might scream. So it should be good, though. My husband checked it out before me. But if you don't know what this is, this is a garden hose. Pretty fun. Um, let's say, if this garden hose will cooperate with me, let's say that this garden hose is what living a life crucified with Christ looks like. If I were to hook this up to a spigot, which I won't because I think I'd get in a lot of trouble between Pastor Dan and Isaac. <laughs> but if I were to hook this up to water, <laughs> okay, oopsie. <laughs> well, again, hey, there's water coming out of it. Well, anyways, if I, was hook if I were going to hook it up to water, water would come right out of it if it was straight. But 
if we, and it would fill up whatever it was filling up until it overflowed. How many of you guys are gardeners in the room? Anybody? Yeah. So, you know, you can overflow things. But if you have a garden, what's the one thing you don't want to happen to your garden hose when you're watering? Yeah, you don't want it to kink or you don't want it to bend. Well, if this is us living a crucified life and we're on that straight where we have water flowing through it, let's say we get around a friend who makes us feel like we have to compromise our morals in order to fit in. There's a bend in the hose. Let's say that we're watching something or doing something that grieves the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living inside of us. It bends the hose. So if I were to hook this up to water now, would water flow through it? No. And if it did, it'd be like trickles of water. When we try to turn that water, it's not going to work. When you bend to the world, just like this hose, the water, the flow of the Holy Spirit, that water in your life stops gushing out and it stops overflowing. So your conversations with people who need it aren't going to look the same because that Holy Spirit isn't being activated. Friends, in our lives, we can't bend and live a crucified life. There's no both and. Remember how in point two I said daily? We have to make decisions daily to not bend, to fit into what the world says is good. And today that's hard. It's hard to determine. But we have a thing right here. The thing right here tells us what we're not supposed to bend on. We're called to a higher standard because we know the truth of the gospel. In 1 John 2.15 it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We aren't meant to be worldly and crucified with Christ at the same time. Like I said, it's impossible. We must choose who we will follow and die to ourselves daily. And I want to say with that too, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that we hate people or we're mean to people who are living, a lives, that are, who are living lives that are worldly because God loves all of us. Amen. What it does mean is that we stand apart and don't do things that follow a non-believers. Right. But because in this story, we can't be like the Jewish Christians who look down on the Gentiles. What we are called to do is to share the life-changing gospel with everyone and pray that God alone changes their hearts and to what the Bible says. So to recap it, in order to live a life crucified with Christ, we must fall in love with Jesus, we must die to ourselves daily, and not bend to fit into the world. Some of you in this room might be thinking, I need to die to myself daily and stop bending who Christ called me to be to fit in. And if that's you, I have a step for you to do. Find someone in your life who can hold you accountable. In the story, Paul calls Peter out on bending to the world. We all need people in our lives who are going to call us out in a loving way when we're not living a life crucified with Christ. I love how Barry and Pastor Dan were talking about having men in your life. Have friends. If you're a man, find, find another man that can hold you accountable. If you're a woman, find another woman in, in, in the room. Whether that's maybe someone you met out in the lobby. Maybe that's someone in your life group. Maybe that's someone you serve with. Have someone hold you accountable. I love our life groups at New Life Church. They are so special. And they are so great for people to be able to get to know people and go through things alongside them. But I want to call out one of our life groups. We have an amazing life group in our church right now that um, is called Freedom from Addiction. And anything else? Freedom from Addiction and Abuse. And what that group does is they meet weekly here at the church and they practice being accountable with each other. And they practice what it looks like dying to self every day and not bending to what the world says is good anymore. Get in a life group. Find people you can be around. Maybe if you're in the room and you struggle with an addiction, find, find those group leaders. They're going to be out in the lobby by the prayer room. They're going to have that life group going through the fall. If that's not you, there's other amazing life groups that you can get into as well. Some of you might be in the room thinking, I'm done with living for myself. And I want to live that life crucified with Christ, but I don't know who Christ is. Friend, Christ died for you. In this passage, it says 
that um, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for you. I don't know a lot of people who give themselves for someone else, but Jesus did. If that's you, I'm going to ask you in a couple minutes to make a decision. And I can tell you, it is the best decision that you will ever make. And I can tell you this too. Like I said in the beginning of this message, it's not going to be easy. This is not a one, two, three, and you're done kind of thing. This is hard. This is something you're going to have to do daily. You're going to have to work on it. It's not easy, but it is worth it. Go ahead and bow your heads with me. God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for each and every person in this room who, um, who's just a son and a daughter of you. God, I thank you that um, you sent your son to die on the cross for us so that we can live a life with you. God, I thank you for the people in this room who um, can help other people when they are um, needing accountability. God, I pray, Lord, that we would just, as we go into... Um, a season of life groups in the fall, that God, you would bring so many people to come into life groups to seek accountability and that you would prepare those to hold other people accountable as well. That God, this would be a time where we get to, um, we get to truly live out what Proverbs um, 27, 17 says, where what iron sharpens iron, one friend sharpens another. That God, you would help us to be able to hold each other accountable and hold each other up. God, I pray for those in the room who maybe don't know you this morning, but are feeling a stir in their heart, feeling like a knocking on the door of their heart to know you. God, I pray, Lord, as they're sitting in their seat, that they would listen to that knock and they would open the door to you. Some of you in this room might be feeling something, you know, we kind of say messing with you. And that's God knocking on the door of your heart and asking, will you let me in? So if that's you this morning, and you want to live that crucified life, you want to make the decision to follow Jesus, will you raise your hand on the count of three so I know who I'm praying for? With no eyes open, heads bowed. One, two, three. God sees you. God loves you so much. And I am so excited because this is the best decision you will ever make. If that's you, go ahead and repeat after me from your lips to God's ears. God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for me and paying the transaction fees for my salvation. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help me to live a life crucified with you, that you would help me to fall more in love with you, that you would help me to die to myself daily, and that you would help me to not bend who you've created me to be to fit in with other people. God, I thank you so much for that. I thank you that you sent your son to die for me. And I thank you that you forgive my sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.